Woods, what is one thing that you want to do on your bucket list? I'll probably go skydiving. By chance, Chooch, was one of your bucket list items to ride in a fire truck? Because we just you just missed your opportunity. My bucket list, I do, I want to scuba dive for the first time. I want to be under the water. So we're going to start with you because you're the wise one in the group. That's what I heard. Are you saying I'm the oldest? <laughs> you Matt in Thailand. You know, I've died in Thailand quite a few times. How you doing? More traveling, right? More travel, always. Ride a mule to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. You guys coming with us? We'll come. We'll come and video the whole thing. Got a lot of people watching this morning. Give it up for Holly in Florida, Arizona, Bill. Christina in Mississippi. I'm, I think in Mississippi, you're moving here next month. Come on, there's plenty of room, plenty of houses. We have great roads. There's no traffic. You're going to love it. Clifford in Ohio, Gary and Lisa, Michigan, Kimberly, Kentucky, Tanessa in Pennsylvania, Mike and Trish in Nevada. Everybody give it up for 20, over 20 states watching right now. Give it up. That's pretty cool. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, one of the earliest letters the Apostle Paul would write to this group of Christians, this church in this ancient Greek city known as Thessalonica. Turn to your neighbor and say that, Thessalonica. Thessalonica. First and foremost, we've got to stop. We've got to think about this. Who was not at church last week because of Smoky Mountain Thunder, the motorcycle ride? Let's fess up. You were on your way, but you got stopped in traffic, and you said, forget it, and you went on to Aubrey's. Let's see some hands. Thanks for coming, guys. Next year, we will adjust. We've got to figure out that because that was a 21-minute disruption in traffic to get into church. And I know some people already told me. They came up to me this week. They're like, Brent, our service is an hour. By the way, we love that. We love our focused hour service. Thank you for it not being three and a half hours. But today is an hour and 45 minutes. No, I like when we start, we begin on, on time, we end on time, I need you to engage with me. But they did say this to me, Brent, service is an hour, we were waiting in traffic for 20 plus minutes, we decided to kind of pick it up on our phones as we drove to Applebee's. I thought that was at least honest. So last week, if you missed it, we started a summer series called Bucket List. Why the series? It'll come on the screen. This is our intent for 10 weeks. Number one, to live life intentionally. We got to really think through that. To identify what's important is a powerful statement because we always need to fight for that as well and to invest in God's kingdom. More than ever, we need to identify things in our life should be on our bucket list, that list of things we do before we kick the bucket before we die, what are we going to do to live our life intentionally, to identify what's important, and to invest in God's kingdom? We, we jumped into two questions that is in the movie The Bucket List. Two questions. Number one, have you found joy in your life? And has your life brought joy to others? That is huge. Do people see something different in us? And that's this week on our bucket list. So, if you missed last week, we sat down as a creative team. We looked at a lot of people's bucket list items. We, had a, a, we did a snapshot here a little over a month ago, Ask you to write down what's on your bucket list. We asked people, man on the street interview right there in Gatlinburg, what's on your bucket list? It is amazing to see how many people wrote down swim with sharks. We're infatuated with what's under the sea. How many want to swim with shark? Let's, let's, start, let's start benign. Who would like to swim with dolphins? Let's see some hands. Oh, they call him Flipper, Flipper. Remember, that was a great show. Who wants to swim with sharks? Let's see. Yes. Who wants to swim with whales? Yes. Who has no interest in going down below the water and swimming with something that might eat you? Yes. So it is amazing that if you ask people what's on your bucket list, that's going to rise to the top. So this week, we sat down with this list. Pastor Matt brought up in the creative meeting, and he goes, Brent, look at my list. This is a thing that I wrote in the 11th grade, specifically said I would like to swim with a whale shark. He specifically wrote that. So we're like, 
Wonder if the Smokies, Tennessee Aquarium, the Smokies Aquarium of the Smokies, wonder if we could go swim with the sharks. So we called them and they said, no, they don't have that program. We have people that work there. We're like, listen, we'll sign the death waiver. We'll do it, whatever. If anything, we'll throw Matt in. I mean, we'll see what happens. I know the hammerhead. But thanks to Cecily on staff, she quickly did some Google search. And she found out that the Georgia Aquarium has a program that you can go if you are certified to scuba dive. There's the catch. you got to be certified. I was certified in 1990. Matt was certified in 27. You can go, and it's pretty awesome. The price is unbelievably cheap in the world of inflation to go do this. Just a couple hundred dollars. It was amazing. We took our Thursday a day off. It was kind of a happy birthday to me. I told my wife I'm a, a gift from me to me. And then I took Matt along as well, and we got a chance to knock something off his bucket list. And when I was driving down there, I had all of these visions of, man, there's so much spiritual goodness here. Thinking about life in the aquarium thinking about Jonah and the whale. I had all of these things. We're going to swim with a whale shark. We're going to swim with a manta ray the size of a car. We're going to be in this aquarium. It's going to be awesome. So we get there. We toured the aquarium really quickly. We went back in the inner sanctum. But first we do this. Let's show the picture of the whale shark we were swimming with. Just for context, look at the people down below. This was the display window that you could go see. And there's two of those sharks in this 11 million gallon tank. This is the largest aquarium in the United States. For several years when it opened, it was the largest aquarium in the world. So we're like, wow, that's going to be impressive. This next picture, inquiring minds want to know, hey, what's it look like behind the scenes? So you get to go behind the scenes. This is the top of this 11 million gallon tank, this massive aquarium. And then we got a chance to meet our dive master, Andy. There were eight of us. We got a chance to go into the inner sanctum to this orientation room. We all kind of know what we're doing. We've been certified. I have over 100 dives. I used to love to scuba dive until I blew out my right eardrum years ago. I was in, let's see, Rainbow River, Florida. It's a very clear river near Wikiwachi Springs. But there was a, a river that merged into the Rainbow River. This river was murky and had alligators. And I was in Rainbow River, and we, we were so close to the headwaters, I thought I saw an alligator in my peripheral vision coming at me. It wasn't. I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but my ear was congested and I turned my head real fast because I thought I saw a gator, blew my eardrum out. My friends saved me. It was a crazy thing. And since then I've had issues with the ear, but God's healed it. So I, I get a chance to scuba dive again. I used to love to spear fish. If you've never spear fished, oh, some of you fishermen, you just think doing that's fun. You get down there and go, Pling, that is fun. It's another, another story. So we got a chance to go. We all kind of knew what we were doing. Andy has given us the rules and regulations. He's telling us what's going to happen. He's going to give us a rule. Number one, don't touch any fish in the aquarium. If you touch fish, there's two safety divers with you. And if they look at you, observe you trying to touch a fish, he said you will aggressively be removed from the aquarium. I thought, okay, I'm not going to touch a fish. Second rule, we're going to stay at the, one, the bottom one-third of this aquarium. Do not come up to the top two-thirds of the aquarium and swim. That's where the whale sharks swim in the top two-thirds, and they will eat you. So stay in the bottom. No, they won't eat you. They're, they're okay. One-third. And he gave us some, I mean, this is an incredible habitat. They allow eight people a day to do this if you're certified. And so we got a chance to get down to the bottom, and then we had two laps around this aquarium. Before we jumped in, though, Andy's going to make this statement. He was an incredibly contagious, enthusiastic person. He's going to say, guys, you're going to jump in this water. It's going to be an experience of a lifetime, bucket list, blah, blah, blah. He's going to go, but the highlight of this dive is not going to be what you think it's going to be. I'll leave it at that, he said. So we jumped in. We got to the bottom of this 30-foot aquarium. We did all of our checks. Everything's okay. We've got our air gauges were fine, and we would make two laps around the aquarium. We would start. Pretty soon, we would come up to the observation tube. It'll come on the screen next where people are walking through that tube. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, here come humans into the equation. We swim by the tube when 
everything changed for me. People started to light up in that observation tube. I would swim by. They would stop. They would wave at me. <laughs> Babies were doing kisses. One of the first things is stop. Power of first impression. This young couple was there, and I, I'm like, I'm just swimming up to the tube, and they stop. And they're like, and they're, they're hand gesturing me. I know what they're doing. I'm in the middle of my face is here. And they turn to their camera and they take a selfie of each other with me in the middle. <laughs> it's awesome. We did that. We swam now near the observation window, this larger than life window. And from the blue with all of these people behind the glass just sitting there, a little amphitheater staring at all the fish and the whale sharks in the aquarium. Here come eight human beings onto their screen. They weren't expecting us. We start waving. They start waving. Parents start getting their kids and putting their kids up on the glass, and I'm touching the glass all the way down. I mean, I'm enjoying this. I felt like a rock star. I felt like Aquaman. People were, you could tell the other guys were like, I want my turn. Matt's trying to kick me out of the way. I'm like, Matt, just go swim that way. I'm here talking to the people. This is awesome. Matt had to tap me on the shoulder and say, Brent, there's a whale shark coming right at you. Whatever. Look at the kids. We did a whole other lap of that. Same thing. Selfies, smiles, waves. People were into us. This was, this, I felt, I felt like I had hair. This was, oh, I mean, like, look at us. We get to the top. Andy, as he's grabbing my tank off me and we're throwing it up onto that deck, I got out of the water. He goes, what'd you think? I thought, man, I said, Andy, this was awesome. He goes, the highlight of your dive wasn't anything in that aquarium, was it? No. He goes, it was the people, wasn't it? Yeah. He goes, you felt awesome, didn't you? Yeah. He goes, isn't that amazing? He goes, I get to dive twice a day. Sometimes I get to clean the aquarium and you have these people just staring at these fish and they're not expecting humans to come on the radar. And all of a sudden human beings come into their display window and people get so fired up. Why is that? Well, you ever, anybody own an aquarium? See some hands if you own an aquarium. You know, in our kids' ministry, we have an aquarium in the front office there. That was Javon and I's personal aquarium until I was so sick of cleaning it. I'm like, let's give it to the church. The children need it. The children need it. But fish kind of bore me because fish are oblivious. You go to an aquarium and you knock on the window, they're not looking back at you. Some people, first service, corrected me. Well, dolphins do. They're not fish. But fish, have you ever gone to the shark encounter at the Ripley's Aquarium and you like knock on the glass, the hammerhead swimming by? He's not like stopping and looking at you and shining his teeth and like, I'll kill you. I would love for that. Wouldn't that be awesome? He doesn't do that. They don't. They just swim by. They're oblivious. So here's my point. You're like, Brent, what's wrong with you? What does this have to do with 1 Thessalonians? A lot. Welcome to the fishbowl. Kenny Chesney wrote the song that Scott just sang over 10 years ago, and he said, hey, I wrote it because the world has become this incredible fishbowl with technology and everything that we have as a, as a society and as a culture. Everything is getting smaller. We all know what we're doing. We kind of welcome it. We get ticked off, and we don't want people to get into our business when we think of privacy, but yet on social media, we can't seem to go anywhere without splashing everything that we do, right? You can't go to a restaurant without taking a photograph of you and your wife and the lobster that you're eating. Just throwing that fish out there for you, that crustacean. We can't go to the beach. I, I laugh out loud every single day, especially this time of year. Go on Facebook right now. You're going to find somebody with tan legs with their toes pointed up and the beach in the distance. And they're going to put, because no one's original, this is my current situation. Have you ever seen that before? Raise your hands. Come on. Why do they do that? Because they go, look at me. I'm a winner. You're a loser. I'm here. And you're not. That's what we do. <laughs> you can't go to a concert without the proverbial 30 seconds of your favorite artist singing the song. And everybody, in the, woo, woo. I mean, that's what we do. We want to, we gravitate toward people looking at us. Hey, our life means something. People are paying attention. I got that many likes, whatever. But do we as Christian understand that we're living our life in a fishbowl? Or are we as Christians oblivious like fish are and don't really care that people actually are watching our lives? Not to be Debbie Downer, but 
A lot of Christian surveys have been done that make me so sad. Barna does one of the best surveys. They've done surveys really in the last 30 years of is there a difference between a believer and a non-believer when it comes to our lifestyle. They would actually do studies on divorce, pornography, alcohol, all the different things that you would think, all right, there should be a massive difference between a believer and a non-believer, but there is, there's not. Do you realize, do I realize that we are the only Jesus that some people will ever see? Do you realize that? Do you understand the power of that? Do you understand that people are paying attention? And it might not be why you think they're paying attention. Well, they're just wanting me to see if I'm going to screw up in my life. No, they're actually looking to see if we are any different, if our faith matters. So Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul would go to this church at Thessalonica. He wasn't really intentional when he went. He had a vision. He went. He planted a church. He would write 1 Thessalonians just a couple of years later. The church was was doing well. Their reputation was intact. They weren't the oblivious Christian. They understood that people were watching, and their life really, their reputation really was making a difference. Remember this. Some of you need to hear this. Your integrity is different than your reputation. My integrity is different than my reputation. I can fool you. You can fool me. Integrity is this. Integrity, who you are when nobody's looking, is who you are. Your reputation is when the world is watching, when all of a sudden we enter into people's display windows, what are they seeing? Are they seeing everybody else, or are they seeing something completely different? Because we carry ourselves as not oblivious, but hey, we're the only Jesus. We're a light in a very dark world. So Paul, he writes to this church. This church is on a major Roman road. The the city, the Greek city of Thessalonica is on a major Roman road. It's a seaport. So there's a lot of cultural influence coming in from everywhere. A lot of cross currents, worshiping pagan religions. Lots of people were doing lots of different things. And here a church has been built. It needs to be strengthened. There's a bunch of immature Christians. But yet they are choosing to live their life in such a way that they understand that people are paying attention. So if you have your Bibles, I want to read for a while. I want us to pick apart a few things that we need to pay attention to this week. When we think about life in a fishbowl, we can think about lots of different things. We can think of Jonah and the well. We can think of, hey, we as a church, we are followers, fish. There's all kinds of great spiritual analogy. But ultimately, I'm after this. Do people see Jesus Christ in me and you? In the world that we live in, the world that has gone crazy, in the world that everybody can be cynical and jaded, do they see a bunch of Christians who are depressed, who are rude, who are doom and gloom, who have no hope? Do they see us living a life that is no difference than anyone else? Why would they possibly want what we have in Christ? Why would they ever want to follow Christ? Do, does our life actually draw people to Christ, or does it push people further away? That is the most needed question. So chapter 1, verse 1, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you, Paul would say. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your, here we go, ready, work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that God has chosen you because our gospel came to you simply not with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction 
You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God Boom. Here we go. Ready? Drop the mic. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't even need to say anything. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They, the world, the culture, the people responding back, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and you wait for his son Jesus from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues you from the coming wrath. Welcome to the fishbowl. Do you accept and are convicted by that? In my life and in your life, when people look at us, are we making the name of Jesus Christ famous? Do people see something different in us? Or do we go, man, I don't want people, I'm so sick, I don't want people knowing my business. People are watching. Welcome to my world. I live my life in a fishbowl. Y'all know that, right? Some of you run into me all over the community. We're a very large church in a very small community. It happens to me all the time. It happened to me two weeks ago. Every time I go to the grocery store, every time my wife traps me into taking that list on the refrigerator and going to the store because I'm trying to be a nice husband and show the love of Jesus to her every time (laughs) this happens. I'm pushing the cart down the grocery aisle. Somebody walks up to me, Lou. Hey, preacher, what's up? You think they make eye contact with me? What's in the basket? Every time, two weeks, every time. What's the preacher buying? Got any beer in there? No, Diet Mountain Dew. Every time, people, you're you're like, man, that would get old. I signed up for that. I'm okay with that. A couple of, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I'll tell that story. I'm still convicted by that story. I still feel bad about it. My wife laughs at me. But a lady in our church, she saw Javon and I. We were in the chicken aisle right there next to the butcher's section at Food City. I was buying some steaks. I like their burgundy pepper marinade, that dry marinade they put on your steaks right there at Food City. It's great. If you ever try it, try it. Change your world. Life-changing. So we're right there at the chicken aisle. She comes up, hey, Pastor Brent, Giovanna, what's up? And she's stopped. And, of course, they never look at you. They always look at what's in the grocery bag. Well, what's in the cart there? (gasps) Oh, you guys are eating steaks tonight, huh? She had this really weird look on her face. And I'm like, yeah, is that okay? She grabbed the hot dog pack out of her cart. Well, my family and I, we're eating hot dogs tonight. I felt so bad. I'm like, I'll buy you the steaks. I'll eat the hot dogs. Look at me. Does it think I, I don't care. I mean, I love it. But people pay attention. You realize they're paying attention how I treat my son at the ball field. I'll put my head in shame. They pay attention to the movies that we walk in. They pay attention to what we order at a restaurant. People walk up to me all the time. And I'm, and I'm, I know what they're looking for. I'm like, here, would you like some unsweet iced tea? Trust me, I pay attention to you, and here's what I'll say. If this happens and you do this, you are convicting yourself. Be careful because you're like, well, having a glass of wine and a beer is fine, Brent. That's not a sin. I, hey, I'm not going to preach that. Having one glass of wine and a beer is a sin. I'll preach that that stuff is a gateway to bad things. But when I walk up to you and it happens every single time, when you grab your beer and you slide it behind the menus on the table, every time. You are convicting yourself. You're like, well, why, why would I? I know Brent doesn't care, but <laughs> why would I? I swam on a guy's boat one time in Douglas Lake. I just happened to be passing by. I jumped out of the boat, and I was swimming to his boat, and he stopped me. Pastor, don't get on my boat real quick. And you could hear the cans and the bottles in the bottom. I swam back to the other boat. It's amazing to think about our lives. When I swim into your screen and you swim into my display window, what are people seeing? When our kids look at us as as husbands and wives, as parents, co-workers, next-door neighbors, friends, do they see something different in us? So Thessalonians, what we just read, it'll come on the screen. What 
What should others see when they look at us? When we even talk about the gospel, when people hear our message, our transformation story, when they hear about the love of Jesus, do they hear that in us first off? And what do they hear when we talk about that? What do they think about us? What do they think about Christianity from us? What should others see when they look at us? That is a great question because we are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. It goes to old messages and even newer messages. April the 3rd, I was on a flight. I preached this service at 11.15. I shook hands. I went to McGee Tyson Airport. I jumped on a plane to Florida because my son and wife were already down there. Mason was playing baseball for spring break with his high school team. I had to fly Delta. That was the only way to get down there that day. I jumped on a Delta flight. Delta is a lot better than Allegiance. A lot of Delta planes are newer. They have the TV in the seat in front of you. You sit down. You put your earbuds in. You watch a television station that you desire. There's limited channels. I'm old. I watch the news. Just a few weeks before that, the Ukraine war had started. We were a month into it. It was still all over the news. People were so passionate about helping Ukraine. These people are being annihilated by Russia. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to stand up? Are we going to make a difference? I mean, people were pouring out their souls on the news channel. Politicians, actors, Sean Penn, you know, everybody was like, we got to do something. I mean, we were fired up about it. The message was oozing out of them. Their passion for helping people not be destroyed was unbelievable. It made me sit up and pay attention. When all of a sudden, and some of you have been on a plane, you know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, we're taxiing back, and there's this announcement interruption that comes on my screen. I'm watching what I want to watch, and Delta is reminding me I have to pay attention to the flight attendant who is now giving us instructions. We've all been there. Hey, welcome to this flight, Delta, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Let's just go through a few things. Number one, you need to pay attention to the safety card in front of you. Would everybody grab that safety safety card right now and look at the different exits on the plane? Do you think one person grabbed that safety card? We're all annoyed that they're interrupting our television time. Okay, now buckle your seatbelt in case the plane crashes that, that might save you. Uh, Your seat is a flotation device. At that time, I was going from Knoxville to Atlanta. I'm like, are we going to crash in a rock quarry? I mean, why why do we even have to worry about that? The oxygen will fall out. Maybe if we're hurling toward earth in a fiery ball of death, you might need to breathe a few more seconds so you're not passing out and you'll be burned alive. But let's at least put that on our kids first and, you know, all of the things that we've... She goes through her whole spiel. She's yawning. The plane is tired. No one is caring an old, tired message. Oh, by the way, that could save your life. No one cares. You've heard it. I've heard it. I wonder, is that how people think about Christians today? The gospel is some old, tired, stale message because no one seems to be passionate like they were about saving the Ukrainians. That's a new message. We need something new. Our culture is always about something new. But this old message, the gospel message that will change your life and save your life, my life, it cannot be like we're yawning and we're stale and we're tired and we're just going through the motions. I wonder if what people see when they see us. Number one, the Apostle Paul, we're going to bring this up, right? It's, he says it in, in these verses. The world should see our working faith. They should see transformation. Faith has got to be more than information. It can't just be words on a page. It's got to be the power of a transformed life through the Holy Spirit. Do people see that you and I are living out our faith? Are we perfect? Of course not. But are we vulnerable enough? Are we authentic enough? Do people see, wait a minute, there's something different about you. There was an old you and there's a new you. Do they understand that? Heard an old story one time. You won't like this. I laugh out loud. Some of you won't like this, but it's funny. A family, a country family, way back in the sticks. I mean, they lived so far in the country anyway was towards town. They went to this this city. It was new. It was modern. It was back in the day. They'd never seen modern buildings like this. They'd never seen all the the new trappings. They walked into this building, and all of a sudden, an elevator door opened, and this old codger looked in, and he saw this little five-by-five empty room, and there was no other exit. He's like, what is going on with this door going to a little room with no exit? And all of a sudden, some old lady just kind of walked up, pushed the button, 
She got in. She turned around, stood there. He's like, what? The door closed. He was mesmerized. A few minutes later, the door opened. The old lady wasn't in there, but some smoking hot young woman was in there, and she <laughs> walked on out. That old codger was confused. It's like, this is a ma- son, go get your mama quick. This is a magic room. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There's a great statement here. Do people, in my life and your life, do we understand that time when the old became new? When they see a difference in us? It's, it's about faith. The Apostle Paul says, hey, you know what? Paul, Timothy, Silas, these men of faith who planted this church in Thessalonica and began to walk this road, preach this gospel, these Young, immature believers didn't know everything about everything, but they began to imitate Paul and Timothy and Silas and ultimately imitate the Lord because what Paul would begin to show and share about the love of Jesus, they would fall in love with Jesus and the world would begin to see these people who fell in love with Jesus and all of a sudden there would be more people falling in love with Jesus because of the way they carried themselves. And it's amazing to think about that our kids, especially kids, we get this this whole incredibly fascinating thought. Our kids imitate us as parents. They love what we love. Case in point, let's go to the lake. My granddaughter, Lily, this was last, last week, Memorial Day, Monday. My daughter on the right, my granddaughter, Livy on the left. My daughter loves the lake. She lights up when we talk about Douglas Lake. She loves it. She'll go lay on that pad all day long. We'll hook that pad to the edge of the bank. She'll go lay out there and boats will come by. Tsunami waves. We'll love it. Now we throw Livy Lee out there. She's 16 months old. She loves it. Why does she love it so much? Because her mama loves it and it rubs off. I wish some of us would get as excited. I haven't said this in any service, so I'll say it to you. I wish we would get this much excited about Jesus as we are Top Gun Maverick. Man, I'm, just, I'm, I'm leaving now. Let's go home. That was, have you listened to Facebook? <gasps> That's the greatest movie of Scott. That's the best movie ever. It's changed my life. I've never seen a movie that good. By the way, Tom Cruise looks incredible to be 60. Talk about old and new. Whatever <laughs> elevator he's on, I want some. <laughs> Jennifer Conley too, but that's a whole nother message, right? Do people see any excitement? Do they see the love of Jesus in us? Because I promise you, when we swim up in people's display windows, they are going to pay attention. And when we stand out for Christ and people see faith, secondly, they see love. And in just a minute, they're going to see hope we stand out. We're going to talk about this next week. Uh, Back to love. We're going to talk about love next week. Be here next week. We're giving away gas cards in all the services. Yes, the first four rows. You're like, I'm sitting on the front. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to give away some gas cards. You're going to see a bucket list moment that you're all going to go, I'm proud to be a Christian and proud to be a part of Pathways. It's just going to be awesome to think about some things that are on our bucket list. So we're going to talk about love next week. Our generosity earns us the right to talk about our theology. Do people see us loving people? Just paying attention, being kind. And lastly, the most importantly, it'll come back on the screen, hopefully hope, right? People should see an enduring hope. Somebody said this, and I really think this is, A very powerful quote. Other men only see a hopeless end, but the Christian rejoices in an endless hope. The Thessalonian believers had real, visible, enduring hope. They hoped for three things. Verse 10, that God, and to wait for Jesus Christ from heaven, Jesus' return, number one, they hoped for Jesus' return. Verse 10 of chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians. They knew that Jesus would come. Are we ready for that? Every single day should be like it's our last. Two, they hoped in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ rose again and conquered the keys of death, hell, and the grave, that we have an enduring hope. We do not walk around hopeless like everyone else does. And lastly, they hoped in Jesus' rescue from coming wrath. We can talk about that in a couple of ways. We can talk about the coming judgment of God. The Bible speaks of that. There will be a day because of God's justice, that God will 
will come and he will set all things straight. But really, hope is what kept the Thessalonians focused through suffering because they suffered. Uh, They had to handle persecution and trials. Uh, We deal with finances and health and things that cause us anxiety. When we worry, we get so stressed out, do we place our trust and our hope in God? I wrote it this way. The primary reason I think people are watching us today when you think of the idea of a fishbowl is they're looking to see if we're real and if we have found real hope. The bottom line, do people see Jesus in you and me? Do they see a real faith, a real love, a real hope, or do they simply see a religious person peddling a stale, old message? About seven years ago, a letter was given to me um, by a lady in our church. It still so convicts me. It so inspires me. It was It was a letter to another Christian. It was a letter written by a relatively new Christian to the person whose life had influenced her so greatly. She'd actually wrote about a dozen qualities down that she found contagious in the life of this older Christian lady that so inspired her as she began to watch her. Listen to some of what she wrote. You know, when we met, I began to discover a new vulnerability a warmth, a lack of pretense that impressed me about you. I saw in you a thriving spirit, no signs of internal stagnation anywhere. I could tell you were a growing person. I liked that. I saw you had strong self-esteem, not based on some fluff or self-help book, but on something a whole lot deeper. I saw that you lived by your convictions and priorities, not just by convenience. I'd never met anyone like you before. I felt a depth of love and concern as you listened to me. You didn't judge me. You tried to understand me. You sympathized and you celebrated with me. You demonstrated kindness and generosity, and not just to me, but to everybody around you. I was watching. You stood for something. You were willing to go against the grain of society and to follow what you believe to be true, no matter what people said about you and no matter how much it cost you. For those reasons and a whole host of others, I found myself really wanting what you had. And now that I've become a Christian, I just wanted to write you and tell you how grateful I am beyond words for how you lived out your Christian life in front of me. preacher wrote this a long time ago, when a penetrating life backs up preaching lips, the gospel is unstoppable. As a church, we're all about upreach. My goal each week is to allow our faith and life to collide, to walk in the door and go, you know what, I want something in my life to convict me. I want to grow in my faith. We're all about inreach. We help each other. We do life together. We as a church can do so much more together than we can apart, but we better be about outreach. And so we know this, right? When your lip service doesn't match up to your lifestyle, that's called hypocrisy. But people today will walk around and go, well, I just want to live my life. I don't want to preach and teach the gospel. I don't want to share and show the love of Jesus to others. But when your life, as a witness, that's great, but it doesn't have any lip service behind it, that's cruelty. That's like me finding the cure for a deadly disease and keeping it only to myself and not telling you, those of you that are afflicted with that same disease, not how to overcome that disease. People today, blow me away. We're the only Jesus that some people will ever see, and we are literally oblivious as we swim by them in our one and only life. People are watching. They're paying attention. They're hoping that we are the real deal. Are we perfect? No. But are we living the life? That's the key. We all should really say welcome to the fishbowl. Will everybody get this message? No, but I'm looking for 10 or 20 or 30 of us that will walk out these doors and like, you know what? Today I will take the challenge. When I go into my world of influence, I want people to see Jesus in me. Do they see faith, love, hope? It's an enduring thing. God, be with us as we close with a song that's perfect 
to have an altar moment together, a, a convicting moment together, a challenging moment together. This song, although over 30 years old, still resonates with me. It should resonate with us all. Do people see Jesus in us? God, allow, allow us to make the biggest difference we can while we can. Allow on our bucket list of life is to show the joy that we have found in Jesus Christ to as many people as we possibly can. Thank you for the hope that we have, the anchor for our soul. In Jesus' name we pray.